Good evening, everyone. I'm Georgia Davis, and welcome to AZ Illustrated Nature. Tonight, we'll take you on a behind-the-scenes visit to a popular destination in northwest Tucson, where you can find some brilliant examples of native desert plants. Learn about a non-native species that has adapted quite well to its new home in the United States, and see some examples of tough trees and shrubs and flowers you can use in your gardens that can take our extreme conditions in southern Arizona. But first, here's a look at today's stories. Congressman Raul Grijalva held an education town hall in Tucson last night where he said federal programs used to close the achievement gap, like No Child Left Behind, do not work. Under the original No Child Left Behind, public schools would be accountable for failing to teach at-risk students. Arizona, like most states, petitioned the Education Department for a waiver allowing school districts to ignore parts of the program in exchange for state plans to improve equity in student academic results. Congressman Raul Grijalva says that move does not solve problems. Grijalva, a Democrat, says when Congress is back in session, he would like to focus on proposals to measure academic growth, not just test scores, especially for students with disabilities. A new report finds Arizona's cancer rate is lower than the national average. The Arizona Department of Health Services finds more than 27,000 people in the state are diagnosed with cancer each year. That means Arizona's cancer diagnosis rate is about 14% lower than the national average. The Department of Health Services compiled data from hospitals and other health providers in a new report examining cancer rates and mortality in Arizona. In the state, the leading type of cancer for males is prostate, and the most common in women is breast cancer. The report also finds more than 10,000 people in Arizona die from cancer each year. Today, the Obama administration announced it has concluded the Syrian government carried out a chemical weapons attack in that country this month. Congressman Ron Barber, speaking at an event in Tucson earlier today, said the president should decide what to do next. Barber added that whatever the decision the president makes must receive congressional consultation, but not necessarily approval. Barber is in town with the Undersecretary of the Army, touring military facilities and southern Arizona defense contractors. He says sequestration cuts are a concern to the Army and wants the Undersecretary to hear from military employees at Fort Huachuca. A state office is considering whether to recommend deregulating private utility companies in Arizona. The Residential Utility Consumer Office is preparing its recommendations on the issue. The proposals to deregulate utilities have been debated for more than a decade, and the director of the office says he expects the department to release its recommendations by mid-September. The Sonoran Desert is a rich bioregion known for its diversity of plant and animal life, and you won't be able to find many of the local species anywhere else in the world. Experts list several reasons for this variety of flora and fauna. They include the extensive landmass of this desert, its topography, and two typically rainy seasons in the summer and winter. Tonight, we'll show you some examples of the many plants that have adapted to these difficult conditions in this behind-the-scenes look at Tohono Chul, produced by Tom Gillespie. Tohono Chul Park, northwest of Tucson, has been recognized as one of the world's great botanical gardens. In existence for more than 30 years, endemic plants, including the familiar and the uncommon, are featured through seasonal landscaping and in their specialty gardens. This is our ethnobotanical garden. Things that were brought in by the Spanish early on in, uh, and adopted by the, by the indigenous people, and some of the things are native to Arizona. And this is our sweet lupins. We have them covered because we have a rabbit problem and they do like to eat them off. Most lupins are actually poisonous to eat. But these sweet lupins, if you take the beans and soak them, you can eat the beans and they're good. And then in between the rows, we have our ee toy onions. And the ee toy onions, we actually separate these and we plant one bulb and then they're a clumper and they'll grow this clump. And they will get about twice this size. We grow two types of fava beans here, Tarja Mara and the Guatemalan purple fava beans. It's a bush that's going to get about two to three feet high, two to three feet across, 
and it produces a big seed pod that has three or four beans inside. And those beans are a deep, deep purple when they come out, and they're beautiful. They're delicious to eat. On its 49-acre plot, Tohono Chul Park displays a sampling of the nearly 4,000 native plants found in more than 100,000 square miles of Sonoran Desert. To support plantings of this magnitude requires a tremendous behind-the-scenes effort, including in the seed repository. This is where we store our ethnobotanical seeds and our seeds for the grounds. This is um, some of the onions we had talked about earlier, and you can see that they are, uh, they're dry here, but the vast majority of these will re-sprout once we plant them. These are the dark purple of those Guatemalan fava beans. Stored in tins to deter rodent smorgasbords, the carefully cataloged seed bank contains seeds for non-edible plants as well including one of the Sonoran Desert's most recognized spring wildflowers. Penstemons is one of our specialties. We have over 50 kinds. These are all penstemon seeds here. What we try to do is mimic what goes on in their own environment. They are collected in the fall. We plant them in the fall. But there's a whole series of events that happen before they get here. Hard to find in these little seeds. But... We use seeds because we're interested in getting the characteristics that come from generations of plants because we want plants that are going to be happy here, that will take the cold and the heat and our low water. And we've seen over time some of the plants actually adapt when you get second and third generations of those plants. Anything that we grow is basically seeds. We do have layering, we do do some divides, we have a few cuttings, but it's basically from seeds. This is layering, it's a vegetative uh, form of uh, propagation. What we will do is make a small groove, insert the node. Layering uses a shoot from the parent plant, covering it with soil until it produces roots, and then separating it from the original. Dividing a plant creates exact copies of the original plant. And cutting buries a piece of the source plant into new soil. The most labor-intensive technique is manually acquiring viable seeds. We put a lot of effort into our propagation program because it's another way where we can show people that the things that they think of when they think of the desert isn't all that's here. There's so much behind that. People are creative and we can create with our environment, with plant propagation, and we can do it in a way that still allows us to live in a beautiful way and in harmony with our region. No matter how they get their start, all these plants require water. According to Tohono Chul staff, hand watering is labor intensive bench sprinklers less so, but more wasteful. So the push is on for even better irrigation methods. We're now using a different kind of emitter system versus the sprayers, and what we found is um, with the, the new emitter, we will put 60% less water on a plant with, with this uh, emitter, and it's consistent. Plants are happier because they're getting treated special, each one and they're being watered the same way every day. The behind-the-scene efforts strive to replicate the natural processes of the Sonoran Desert. The results can be inspirational to the visitors of Tohono Chul Park. We hope that every visitor who comes here will have their eyes, their minds, their senses open to new possibilities. We hope that they will appreciate what the Sonoran Desert has to offer rather than looking at it as what it is not, because there's so much more that it is than the what there is not. The cold hardy, heat tolerant, and drought resistant plants are great for the Sonoran Desert, 
but not when we're talking about non-native species that compete with our endemic plants. Tonight, we'll learn more about one of these plants that has become pervasive in much of the country, including here in the Southwest. We're talking about tamarisk, or salt cedar, and Susanna Perlstein is here to tell us more about the tamarisk. She's a doctoral student in the University of Arizona's Department of Soil, Water, and Environmental Science. And thank you for joining us, Susanna. Thank you for having me. So I have in front of me some branches. They look like they belong to a very beautiful tree, but I guess this is a problem plant? <laughs> um, it can be certainly listed as a problem plant. Um, we're trying to get away from calling it a problem species, especially when you're trying to remain unbiased <laughs> in your science. It's hard to go after a, a problem plant. Um, but this is actually a different species of plant than what I study. It is the same tamarisk, but this is a phyla, the uh, species name. So I'm mostly studying uh, Ramosissima, Parboflora, Chinensis, they're, and their hybrids. Are there any tamarisk plants that are native to the Southwest? No. So they're all, including this one, invasive species. They are all introduced species, absolutely. They were, they came here in the early 1800s and they've spread to almost every state in the United States. And we're trying not to call them invasive species. Um, they're introduced, they've become naturalized to their environment. Okay, I see. So, when did they come over? Where did they come from? They came Actually. from Eurasia. So, in the 1800s, they were brought over from, and Eurasia, think of China, Mongolia, uh, Afghanistan, that area. Um, and they were brought over for kind of on a high, it was a valuable import. They were these beautiful plants. They have a very beautiful flower. Um, and yet, and they were also brought over for soil erosion but they have since spread west and have a lot of what we called hit lists <laughs> attributed to uh, tamarisk in terms of very high water usage, which it actually doesn't, and uh, soil salin salination, salinization, excuse me, um, which it actually doesn't add very much salt to the soil, these kinds of things. The main thing that tamarisk does do that is a relative detriment to the environment is it does have very high and intensity and high severity of forest fires. Okay, so I'm gonna go in that route in just a moment, but first, what is it that about the climate, the soil, the water here that has allowed this plant to so successfully thrive? Absolutely. Well, it's a halophyte, so it means that it can complete its entire life cycle under salty conditions. And so with not 100% uh, attributed to river regulation, but along with river regulation, we no longer have um, natural overbank flooding that leaches salts, and so you are having an increased salty environment and also a drier environment. And th things like our native cottonwoods and willows, they really depend on these spring floods to help germinate their seeds, and their seeds do not remain very viable for a long time. But tamarisk seeds remain viable for a little bit longer than they do. So that has allowed them to grow into these streamside ecosystems we call riparian areas. Okay, so I was reading that the tamarisk doesn't actually take up more water than other native species. Right. But they grow more densely? Yes. It, it depends on the river system. Um, it, it really does. Um, but yes, they can grow much more densely, absolutely. Okay, so tell me about the beetle. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, along with some collaborators with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, went around and tried to find something that could help, because at the time we were thinking, Tamaris uses so much water that we need to s control its population to reduce its water use so that we can use water for ourselves, not just for drinking water, but for things like recreation, that kind of stuff. And so the beetle was released. It is from Eurasia, it grew up with tamarisk in its native land. They're kind of adapted to each other over in Eurasia. And they came over and it was released in 2001. And since then it has spread. So are the beetles then doing the job they were brought here to do and that is control tamarisk? Well, they are certainly reducing tamarisk's water use. Um, on one study that I'm on, we've seen a 50% reduction in water use um, in just one year of beetle arrival. Well, how are the beetle populations doing here? Um, they, they are expanding. Um, when they were first introduced, it was thought that they needed a certain day length requirement if they were, and that if, to reach reproductive age, and that if they were released at a 
certain higher uh, northern latitude that they wouldn't get it, and so that they wouldn't reach reproductive age, they wouldn't move out of that latitude. Um, and unfortunately, that has happened. They have moved. They're in the lower Colorado now, so near the border of Mexico. They might even be in Mexico. Hmm. So how much is known about the beetle and its relationship to our habitat? Because that is another non-native species. Um, it is. It's an introduced species, absolutely. And that's where a lot of the research needs to focus on. We need to look at the beetle is working, it's reducing tamarisk's water use, but we need to look at what is it actually, how is it affecting the ecosystem? How is it affecting how tamarisk grows and the environment that it's in? Is it still fair to call it a non-native species or is this another one that's kind of been naturalized to the southwest? The tamarisk or the beetle? The beetle. <laughs> uh, we're calling it an introduced non-native. Okay. And so, and you're studying the, the link between the beetle and water. I don't know if you can give me, and this is just a very, very short time we've got left, a yeah. little bit about your study and what kinds of results you're seeing. Oh, absolutely. So I'm studying on the Virgin River near Las Vegas. Um, and this is the lower part of the Virgin River, river before it feeds into Lake Mead. And we're doing ground monitoring, sap flow sensors, looking also using phenology cameras, cameras that look at the timing of life events, when do they flower, when do they bloom, that kind of thing, and then also using remote sensing. And what's unique about my study is that we're getting baseline data. Before the beetle arrived, we're getting an idea of what that ecosystem looked like so that now that the beetle has arrived, we can understand what is a normal environment. Okay, well thank you so much for joining us to talk about this. Thank you. An exclusive interview with President Obama here at the White House. We discuss the potential for military action in Syria. We do have to make sure that when uh, countries break international norms on weapons like chemical weapons that could threaten us, that they are held accountable. No one can match King's brilliance, but the same flame that lit the heart of all who are willing to take a first step for justice, I know that flame remains. That's all ahead on tonight's News Hour. AZ Illustrated Nature is your source for global environmental news and the issues unique to our desert landscape. And starting September 9th, AZ Illustrated Nature is moving to Mondays at 6.30 on PBS6. AZ Illustrated, committed to Southern Arizona, committed to you. As we mentioned earlier, successful plants in our Sonoran Desert and similar bioregions must deal with very difficult conditions such as frequent droughts, freezes in the winter, and scorching summers. Next, we'll give you some good options if you're looking for a relatively carefree garden that can take the heat or the cold. Here are six recommendations from a horticulturalist at Tucson Botanical Gardens. We'll follow that story with a recent interview from a member of the Arizona Native Plant Society. Plants that have more of affinity towards Sonora are likely to be the frost sensitive ones. Uh, plants that occur more often in the mountains around Tucson or uh, northern parts of Arizona, those are more likely to withstand that cold. The Peri's agave, agave perii, is one of the agaves that you'll see in the Catalina Mountains or other mountains here growing high up, often reaching up into the pine zone, but it can take our heat down in the valley quite well, and it can take snow, so it has no problem with our cold. It's a very nice agave, it has a nice symmetrical form, and there are different forms of it. You'll find some various varieties that have shorter or longer leaves, uh, different cultivars or different varieties of that agave. It's a nice one for its uh, deep blue color and its nice compact form. It's a mid-sized agave. Like most agaves, uh, when it reaches maturity, it will flower and then it will die. But this one usually does produce some pups from the base and uh, they can be used to grow up to make new agaves. Among the flowers, we have the Peri's penstemon, Pensamon perii, and this is one that you can find out in the desert around Tucson. It grows wild, and we don't even have to plant these here. These drop their own seeds, they come up on their own. Not always exactly where you want them, but usually in large abundance, so we get a nice show of flowers. They're very easy in the sense that often we have to do nothing, but they do appreciate a little extra water, especially if the winter has been fairly dry. 
This is the Desert Spoon. And one of the nice things about this is its shape and color. It has a real architectural form. And like all the other plants we've been talking about, this is a real tough one. This won't be bothered by the cold here in Tucson. And although it's somewhat related to an agave, unlike the agaves, this will not die after it flowers. It will live on to flower again. One of the other uses of this plant, it's covered with very nasty little spines on the leaves. Uh, that makes this a good security plant. This is something that someone will not want to push their way through. And uh, if you would like a security border, then this is a good thing to plant. It's a very low water use plant. You can treat it as a succulent plant. But like many of these succulents and semi-succulent plants, they do need additional water when they are being established after planting. And also, like nearly all plants, you don't want to plant them in the summertime. These are going to be best to ideally planted in the fall. This one you can also potentially plant in the wintertime or early spring. Our native barrel cactus in this region is Ferrocactus wislazeni, and that is a plant that will grow in the desert among saguaros and then up higher into the foothills and uh, it can take a lot of cold. In fact, most barrel cacti in general can usually withstand our winters, although some of the Mexican ones will get uh, burned by extreme cold. But our native barrel cactus is a good one. It can take whatever cold you're likely to experience here in the valley, and it has nice large flowers that open up in summertime. There's also a new variety that's been developed that has pure yellow spines, and uh, that's another form you can consider if you want a little bit of yellow, a yellow uh, spine plant for your garden. Uh, this is the creosote bush, Laria tridentata. And this is found uh, throughout most of the desert regions of the southwest. That's uh, quite a common plant, and it's a really tough plant. This will be able to live in, in really arid deserts. And if you have this growing in your yard, if it's established in your yard, it can survive without any additional water. It's perfectly fine living on rainfall. But although it's a very, very tough plant, it does have a weakness to it, which is that uh, it's not very well adapted to being transplanted. So if you want to plant one of these in your yard, you'll probably have to start with a very small plant and plant it gingerly and uh, nurse it along to get it established because they do not like that kind of disturbance that happens when transplanting. Uh, once it's in the ground and once it's happy, then it's really tough. There are many people who are looking for a plant that can screen off an area that's evergreen, so it retains that screening effect, and uh, that maybe can substitute for oleander in their landscape. Uh, people may want to remove oleander because it's a, it's a toxic plant and, and can be a danger. A good substitute for oleander is the Arizona rosewood, Vaquilinia californica. And this is native to the Catalina Mountains and other mountains near Tucson. It's not very abundant. It does not form a forest there. But at an area around uh, Molina Basin's elevation, you'll see these plants occasionally on the hills. Planted in a landscape, they can grow even larger and almost become the size of a tree. But like a shrub, they'll have uh, many multiple branches from the base. So they really do fan out and form a a nice screening shrub. They have white flowers that occur in summertime, but really their main value is in forming a nice solid backdrop plant that's going to be tough and hardy. joined by Carrie Ann Campbell. She is the president of the Tucson chapter of the Arizona Native Plant Society. So thank you for coming and I'm so excited you're here because I have questions for my own <laughs> garden that I'm hoping we can get to. Um, you know, I came here from Florida, I've lived here seven years and the thing I learned the fastest is it's really hard to garden here. <laughs> it is very different from gardening in a place that has different seasons or lots of rainfall or maybe not such harsh uh, seasons as we do here. Um, but there are such an amazing uh, diversity of native plants in Arizona that we have a lot of plants to choose from that do very well here. 
And something I'm noticing from these plants is they're all flowering, they're all beautiful. And of course, one of the things I hear a lot from my friends is everything stings or sticks or bites or right, scratches, but that's obviously not the case. Absolutely. Um, like I said, in, we have a lot of plants to choose from. In Pima County, there are over 2,500 different species of plants alone. And not all of them have spines and not all of them are cactus. So um, this is a, a, an example of what's blooming right now. And uh, you can see lots of, lots of different um, textures and colors to choose from. What are some of these plants? Sure. Um, well, this one I really like a lot. This is a, a native verbena. And this is a very small one. It, it will, um, it will uh, spread underneath a tree. Um, and it's a wonderful plant for butterfly gardening and a nice alternative to lantana that a lot of people use and sometimes can escape out of your garden. Right, it looks a lot like a lantana. I'm it noticing. does, it does. Um, this is a neat one. This is bladder pod. This is actually an annual and this is one that you can get going in your yard very easily from seed. If you uh, think ahead in the fall and, and put your seeds out in your yard, um, you can get these coming up kind of and they, they make a nice carpet of, of yellow. Of course, something I'm, I'm noticing in my own garden is it's all weeds. <laughs> How well do any of these plants do in competing with the, the weeds that are there? Um, well, you, you always do have to, to keep an eye on the weeds, and, and certainly there are some that you really want to take care of immediately if you have buffalo grass or fountain grass, Bermuda grass, things like that. They can be very difficult um, to compete with for native plants. Uh, this one in the back here is a native evening primrose, and that's one that will also spread and, and keep weeds down if, if you don't have weeds to begin with. All right, something else I noticed when I first got here is it's not easy to find native plants to purchase and plant. So where does someone go to get them? You know, that, that is an interesting question because there are so many nurseries to go to and so many large nurseries to go to, yet you often can't find native plants there. But little known fact, we have lots of great native plant growers locally and um, all over Arizona, if uh, there are uh, growers of native plants and if you go on the Arizona Native Plant Society webpage we have separated by by town um, native plant growers and here in Tucson we have uh, some of our favorites are desert survivors on the west side um, Tohono Chul on the north side and Savano on the east side a lot of these plants today came from Savano and, and Tohono Chul. Unfortunately we're running out of time but uh, just uh, tell me a little bit more about the, your organization and what you do. Obviously it's spreading information about these plants but there's more to it than that. Sure. We are a statewide nonprofit organization, 100% volunteer. And we have chapters throughout the state of Arizona and we are dedicated to um, the, uh, promoting awareness and appreciation of Arizona native, Arizona's native plants and their habitats, um, conservation and restoration of their habitats. Can anyone get involved in this? Absolutely. We have uh, general meetings the second Wednesday of every month in Tucson at the Ward 6 office and we have field trips and to get involved check out our website and you'll see what's going on. All right, sounds good. And you're going to stick around and I'm going to write down the names of all these plants afterwards. Wonderful. Right? All right, sounds good. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us. And that's our show. To post a comment on any of these stories or to keep up with the latest news, you may visit our website at azpm.org. I'm Georgia Davis. Thanks for watching.